questions? You should wait until you hear me for that. So this is uh, version 7.42. Uh, if you've been to my, any of my previous talks in this track, in the previous conferences, it's pretty much the same thing. It's like love songs. You know, you, you always say the same thing in a, in a slightly different way. So I'll try to be uh, creative about that. Uh, what changed in between, so uh, I've been talking about this, this stuff, you know, how do you apply the open source uh, way of thinking and tools in business. Been talking about that for the last lots of years. Initially, I was independent, so I was a one man shop. And then I got hired by Day Software in Switzerland, which was 150 people, and we got acquired by Adobe, 10,000 folks. So it's, uh, it's, it's been a change for my, for, you know, my professional life, and, and I'll try to, to relate to that. So I'm a senior developer in the Adobe CQ5 team, that CQ5 is a large scale content management product, and we're in Basel, Switzerland. Uh, I actually live in Lausanne, which is a French-speaking part, and Basel is a German-speaking part, but we are friends. Uh, I'm a member of the foundation and currently on the, the board of directors. My slides are already on SlideShare, so f as a reward for typing my name, you can see my slides and follow along if you want. Uh, just a small disclaimer, this you know, Adobe is 10,000 people, that's a big thing. You cannot get everybody to agree on this stuff. So I'm not speaking officially about Adobe's position on that. It's my view on things. And I'm trying to push it within Adobe with some success. It's, uh, as I said, you, won't, you will not get everybody to agree, but we have been influencing some other groups with this stuff, and that's, uh, that's uh, a good thing. I'm very jet-lagged. Uh, landed on Sunday, crashed and woke up at 1 a.m. well rested. So I'm still pretty much on Swiss time, so bear with me. I'll try to be maybe not entertaining, but at least uh, alive for the next hour. Uh, we have an hour, which is, should be plenty, so don't hesitate if you have questions, observations to raise your hand. So can, can you do open development inside a business, inside a big company? By open development, I'll explain that in more detail. I mean, working like open source projects, which is, uh, if you're involved in Apache projects, it's often fairly chaotic, lots of discussions, and uh, it's not always easy. And in, in businesses, um, there's a tendency to, be, uh, to have secrets. Uh, sometimes you need to. Uh, but for some, some type of stuff, you don't really need to. And within a team, I think it's not a good idea to have secrets. You want your team to share their wisdom, their knowledge, and uh, so share that openly. And also, uh, who cares if your code is not yet perfect? As Noreen was saying that in the previous talk about documentation, it's never finished. Code is never finished, and sometimes people don't want to share it because it's ugly. I don't want to commit my code because it's not, it's not finished. It's never finished, pretty much. So I think uh, these, these arguments against open development don't, don't stand for me. I think uh, I'll try to explain that sharing and having a culture of sharing and a flow of sharing information all the time is very beneficial for your teams. Uh, in, in businesses, uh, Corporate teams are often look like that. You have, you know, small pots, so small silos, and each team they don't talk to each other. Um, one story about that, which is interesting, when we, uh, shortly after we we were got acquired by Adobe, I was working on on testing tools for Sling. Sling is doesn't matter what it is for for this discussion. It's it's an Apache project. It's an applications layer for for content management. And I was working on, on interesting, I think, uh, testing tools for that. So I, I made some noise about it on my blog and, and some places, and also in an in, in, in internal uh, technical mailing list. And I got three different people from three different areas of the company contacting me, saying, hey, Bertrand, that's cool. I'm working pretty much on, on the same thing. So these guys were each working you know, in three different parts of the company, working on the same stuff, duplicating what the others were doing pretty much, not sharing. And by putting it outside, putting it in a public place, they could all see it and collaborate. And, and we got great contributions from, from these folks. So I think the, 
when you have a big organization, it's inevitable that you will have some separation between the groups, also be because of culture, time zones. There's lots of things that tend to, to foster that separation. But you, you need to try to, to you know, fight this and, and get people together on cross-cutting uh, topics. So creating a, a flow of information is what you want. If everybody is drinking from the same river, uh, the bacteria will spread, and maybe the good stuff as well, you know. So that, that's what you want. You want this flow of, of information. Uh, I'm not a fan of meeting. I'm a, mostly a telecommuter because I live on the other side of Switzerland. It's a three hours commute to go to Basel, so I don't go there very often. Uh, and, uh, but even if you're in the same building, meetings can be great when they're about vision and, you know, really putting neurons together. If you have a meeting about sharing information, it's mostly a waste of time. If it's, you know, kind of status information, that should be flowing all the time. And that's what we, that's what we have in open source. In our Apache projects, people all work in different time zones. Uh, they're also from different cultures. They're f from different companies. Th that's really a recipe for failure. You could, if you study our projects, you could say, this is going to fail. And yet, many of our projects pull out uh, excellent releases uh, regularly, so th this is this is working, and I think it's this flow of information that makes uh, the difference. Oops, wrong direction. I told you I was jet lagged. So uh, the the way we work, so th this started at this um, this company, Day Software. So Day Software was a Swiss company, uh, as I said, about 150 people when we we got acquired. Existed for 15 years. But it remained very much uh, like a startup, the, the way it, it operates. And we have tried to, to keep that in our group, even though we're now part of a larger company. Uh, there was obviously some people who thought we should change. You, you know, you're in a big company now, so you cannot do the same thing anymore. And we fought that. And it, it's pretty much working. We had to adjust some of our processes, obviously. But uh, basically, we, we, we could keep the same uh, the same setup and the same way of working. So uh, we put a lot of uh, emphasis on the issue tracker. Uh, one of the, the principles is that if you're working on something, it must be an issue in the tracker. If you're working on a, you know, you, if I ask you what, what are you doing, what are you working on today, you shouldn't tell me uh, the, you know, the memory bug of the, one of the sorting of the indexes. You should be able to give me a, a tracker issue number. I'm working on CQ-1234, and that's, that's a very precise reference to something in this tracker. You get one page where you have the history of this feature, and that's, a, that's an excellent communication mechanism. It makes sure you speak about the same thing, which is not always obvious uh, when you're in a, in a group, especially in a distributed group. And also, you. By using this, you, you write the history of your project uh, as you go. So we put a uh, lot of importance on this. Uh, on this screenshot, it's uh, still an old Bugzilla. We have something more modern now. We, we're working with Jira. Doesn't really matter which one you use. Uh, even this clunky Bugzilla was working pretty well for us. We couldn't upgrade it because we had customized it, which was a big mistake. Then we couldn't follow the upgrades. So we were still working at the time with an old Bugzilla, but it was still good enough. Uh, it's it, it's more important to use it than exactly what it what it does. So and we we use and abuse the issue tracker. If I need a server setup, I, do, I will create an issue in the tracker. Uh, and that's uh, you know we, everything that needs collaboration coordination, we we use the, the tracker for that. So it's not only for bugs; it's also for features, test setups, whatever. So that's that's the key point in our collaboration uh, setup. And then you need, uh, obviously, an, a, a single code repository. Um, we are working currently, my group and a number of other groups at Adobe are working with Git. Uh, it works very well for us. Could be Subversion, could be even CVS if you, if you need it. Maybe a bit uh, obsolete now, but it's, it would still work. What's important is that you have, again, a central point where your code goes. And your code should be discoverable in that. Uh, one thing that works pretty well in the Apache Software Foundation, we have 150 projects. It's not easy to keep track of what they do. Uh, you know, even though I'm a board member, you, you could probably 
to tell me of about 50 of these projects and I wouldn't know what they are and what, what they do. But still, it's very easy to find the information because you have a standard structure. You know that the FU Apache project will be at foo.apache.org, that's their homepage, and this should link to the mailing list, to the rest of the information. So having a kind of uh, standard way of discovering the projects and discovering their code is extremely useful. Today in the talks, when, when I, I hear people talking, quite often I go to svnsearch.org, I think, and I, and I look up their name. You know, if uh, Isabel is talking in the next talk, oh, what, what's Isabel doing? So you can look up on SVN search and, and see where she's been committing. Oh, she was active in this project five years ago. Now she's active on this project. It's all discoverable. It's all open. So for us, Apache, it's obvious because we're an open organization. You can also do the same thing in your business uh, and have, you know, open discoverable uh, code repositories where people can find stuff without having to ask. And that the self-service notion is also very important. Then on the left side, we have an activity stream. It's nothing fancy. Uh, this morning there was a talk about streams that I found pretty interesting. But it's not even that, but it's more like a conceptual stream. So it could be just uh, email subscriptions to what happens. And then you will get emails whenever someone commits code, whenever an issue changes state, an issue is created, and so on. Any kind of stream that allows you to follow the action is extremely useful. Means also that you can subscribe to the events that you're interested in, what's going on, and, and see the action. So it means also that uh, project managers can make queries in the tracker, they can see the events, they can see the amount of activity. It gives very interesting information. And this is all this flow of, of you know, important but not extremely um, complex information. It's all small events uh, and it's important to have them. If you need meetings for that, that's a waste of time. Uh, you know, this should be discoverable and queryable. If, if the tracker is up to date, because everybody is working on an issue at any time, then uh, it's easy to find out where we are. Look at, look at the tracker, make queries, see how many issues are still open, see, see how they're moving. So this is uh, the basic setup, which creates a shared knowledge base. Uh, we'll see that this information is, is then searchable uh, and allows you to, to look up, which also uh, brings the importance of email down, and that's a very important point. Uh, big companies tend to have, uh, you know, employees of big companies, I would say, tend to use email as their knowledge base. Uh, you know, your email client is your knowledge base. What happens when you leave? When I, or what happens when you join? When you join the company, you have an empty email inbox, so you have an empty knowledge base. It's not very useful. If the information is in this centralized system, it's much easier to find out. You can resync, you can take your time to look at the issues, look at the events, look at the code repository, and find the information by, by yourself. So we tend to, we try to down, downplay the email as much as possible and say that um, email should be mostly throw away. And that's in Apache, it's similar. Email is important because we say if it didn't happen on the dev list, it didn't happen. But email is meant to create the consensus. And then the consensus, consensus will be recorded by creating an issue, by creating code, etc. So email is important, but it's not, it's not the core of the information system. And I think that that's good. And this then enables you to, to Put the meetings that you have, it's a, it's a great luxury to be able to have meetings if, you have a, if your team, team is co-located. But if you can bring these meetings to the next level of actually discussing the vision, the, the, the long-term stuff, or the, the design of the software, it's much more interesting than exchanging information like, yeah, what did you do last week? That's, that's the kind of boring meetings that I don't like. So this is a setup, centralized hub of issues code and uh, discussions that are also archived. I didn't show that here. But we also use mailing lists in our teams like we do in, in Apache. The goals of that uh, setup are, that's four goals, and that's the, yeah, as I said, the same four pictures that I've been using for the last few years, hasn't changed. Um, the goals are to establish a shared vision. That's extremely important in the project group that First, everybody should have the same idea of what you're doing. 
you, you can try the experiment, ask two people in the, in the project what they're doing, and it, they, it, you can get fairly different answers sometimes. So you will try to create a, a shared vision about what is it that we're doing. You will try to have real-time status updates. This is this activity stream that I was mentioning. So be able to follow in real time what's happening in the project, when code is committed, when issues advance to the next uh, step, and so on. You also would like to be able to broadcast help requests. There's a tendency where you have an established team to say, oh, there's, an, oh, there's a memory problem. That's Bob. Bob is the king of memory problems, so we'll ask him. It's good if it's here unavailable, but it's also very powerful if you can just put the, the problem out there. Say, we have a memory problem. Who feels like tackling this today because it's urgent? And maybe, uh, you know, Bill today feels like, oh, yeah, today I'm in good mood, so I want to tackle a hard memory problem. And he, he might be more efficient because he wants to do this today. So the idea is to, to, to broadcast the help request to the group, maybe saying, okay, I think that's Bob that should be um, tackling this problem. If someone else wants to do that now, just grab the issue, assign it to yourself, and do it. And then the, the fourth um, key point here is to create searchable archives of this uh, material. So whatever happens in this system should be archived and searchable so that people who join your team can get up to speed in self-service without having to ask about the basic information. Of course, you will, if you need to work on something, you will, you will need to ask the people to get the details, but at least the basic information should be available in, in self-service. And that's what we have in, uh, in Apache. So the shared vision, we establish it by saying the dev list is where it should happen. So whatever you discuss, uh, you know, if you don't discuss it on the dev list or you don't decide on the dev list, it doesn't count. So the dev list is where you can establish this shared vision. The real-time status updates are these events. Uh, in Apache, it's also usually mailing list. It could be an RSS feed. It could be different types of events. But if you have like a commit or activity list, that, that works as well. The, the help requests are broadcast by way of the tracker. By creating an issue in the tracker, everybody can subscribe and be aware of what's happening. And the searchable archives happen because you index or the systems index this data and make it searchable. More or less, the, the mailing list search is not very precise. Um, one thing about the mailing list is, you know, the, the quoting. People, unfortunately, this is going away, but all time Apache folks tend to be very precise in how they quote messages when, when you reply. And there's a very good reason for that, that it gives much more value to the archives. Because in the archive, you have exactly the question, the answer, you know what, what happened. When you do the top posting, you have the whole junk that, that's still here, which means that the same message will be repeated 10 times in the archives. And the search archives usually don't take that into account. So it makes the search uh, much less uh, powerful. Uh, unfortunately, this, the, the, the mobile devices are driving this. It's much harder on a tablet to do the precise quoting that, that, that we are used to do. So that's, uh, I hope we can, we can overcome that. The, the, the archive system should be able to do that. Like, you know, Gmail does that very well, hiding the, the common parts in messages, but the archives usually don't do it. So let's look at these uh, this, uh, topics in a bit more detail. How do you establish this shared vision? On the left, you have what very often happens in, in corporate settings is a one-to-one -one email. You know that Bob is the king of memory problems, so when you have a memory problem, you send an email to Bob. That's a bad idea, because others won't see it. And just being aware of what's going on. Oh, we have lots of memory problems these days. We, you know, we'll influence your developers. They will know, should be careful about that, or if I suspect there's one in, in the module, I should have a look. So the, the right solution is to have this central hub and always use the dev list to, uh, to, to communicate about technical issues. We do that in the projects where I'm active at Adobe. Um, it was a bit of a culture change for some of our colleagues. They said, you know, it's, it's, I'm getting 200 messages a day. It's not possible. And yes, it is possible. I wrote, uh, uh, called that the large mailing list survival guide for, for our colleagues. You know, be careful, be extremely careful about the subjects uh, of, of your emails. That, that, that's the key. 
then you can skim very quickly on the subject lines, you know, make client say, oh, no, I'm not interested, click, 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 click. Oh, this one is interesting because the, the subject tells me that I should read it. So I, between the Apache projects and the Adobe projects, I process maybe 300 messages a day. Process, I don't read 300 messages a day. I read maybe 10. But by, by skimming the subjects very quickly, you can, you can process a lot of email, and that's efficient. And you still see the other things. So you're still aware of what's going on. You know, like, like a vague chatter in the room. You, you hear it, but you don't uh, need to pay uh, precise attention to it, and, and it doesn't uh, take your energy. So by moving from a one-to-one -one email to a central hub, like a dev list or, uh, you know, um, stack overflow kind of thing or whatever, but a central thing, uh, you will make this communication much more efficient. You will see what go what's going on, but it requires discipline. Yeah, like, like this precise quoting in email, uh, being careful about your subject lines, it requires more effort from, from the people who are writing the messages, but it's, it's really worth it uh, in, the, in the long term. And also, uh, if it's important, it should have a URL should have a permanent URL. If, you, if I'm writing more than three paragraphs in an email, I start to think, does, it, does this really belong here? Is, is it not something that should go on a wiki or on an issue somewhere, and then just send an email that points to that, say, hey, look at the issue that I created. Can you comment there or, or something? I'm not saying you should never send an email more than three paragraphs, but uh, it's usually, it, it can be a bad sign. It can mean that, something that deserves a better better space that email is going on and at least any yeah any information that is meant to stay should have a permanent url like you get in a wiki or in the tracker or in an email archive something like that basically you're creating an, uh, you're creating a hub and spoke model instead of one-to-one -one communications you have end-to-end by sending messages to a central place, everybody sees everything. That's a lot of traffic, you need to get used to that, and you need to, to be careful about what you write, think twice before sending a message, and so on. Same thing for the source code. Uh, the source code should be, should be shared, uh, read-write. Uh, uh, we have uh, version control systems for a reason. It's very easy to revert something, so, uh, I'm not for being too conservative about who gets to write rights, the technical rights for writing in the code. Then there might be a social right. We've also been discussing that in Apache recently. Shall we, shall we open the, all the Apache code repositories to everybody in the foundation? Why not? And then you know that you know, uh, you know, I, have no I have no clue about how Hadoop works, so I won't go into Hadoop and make changes. And if I do it, people can revert it, revert it and tell me, okay, please don't do it. And if I do it three times, maybe they will block me in the end. But you, you could have a social layer of control on top of the, the technical layer. But at least the code should be writable by everybody and discoverable meaning searchable and use conventions for the project names uh, and so on. Another important thing in this uh, communication is to what I call speak in URLs. Uh, when you, so instead of talking about the memory problem, you know, maybe right now we know exactly what it is because we, five of us, we're working on that, so we know what the memory problem is. If you look at the archive two months later, you have no clue. Which memory problem was that, you know? If you use an issue number, for example, CQ-1234, it's very precise, you know what it is. It's not a complete URL, but it's a decent convention that maps to a complete URL. It's obvious for everybody what that means. Um, same thing for mail messages. If you want to refer to a previous mail, uh, please avoid saying, you know, in the other thread. Uh, which other thread? Right now it's obvious. In two weeks, in two months, it's gone. So if you can give a reference to that, uh, that's much better. Same for the for the code code revisions. Uh, you saying if you're saying this works on the current trunk, in two two months from now the current trunk is totally different. So if you can give a revision number, that's much more precise. You don't need to do that every time, but 
it's good it's good to ask ask yourself you know do sh should i put an identifier in this message so that it, it stays longer and if you do that in issues in commit comments uh, everywhere it will create a very rich web of links between this information then it gives much more much more value to your our archives so this is about the uh, this central hub of communication The next step is to implement these real-time updates, uh, which will help managers know what's going on, you know, the people who have to answer, where can we ship? Uh, if you have a good issue tracker management and you have small issues, granular, atomic, it's much easier to find out. It's also much easier to reassign things in a crisis when shipping date is tomorrow and you have uh, 100 issues left and you have maybe 50 people working on it, so it's totally possible to do it. But if you have already assigned the issues to everybody in a fixed way, and someone has 20 issues, they won't get it in, in one day, so it doesn't work. So by having small issues in the tracker, you can reassign them fairly easily, or people can look at them and say, hey, what can you do until tomorrow? What issues would you like to work on? What you feel on, what you feel like working on now? And if you work on something that you show yourself, you'll be much more efficient. Because that, that, you know, oh, I wanted to work on that, so I do it. So being able to, to reassign this is, is very useful. And then you, that's also a big contribution to these real-time updates. So where you have the tracker, the uh, code repository, and the email uh, discussions feeding this activity stream, which can be as simple as a mailing list called activity at uh, whatever your project name is, or more sophisticated, like, uh, like RSS or whatever makes sense. But the idea is to have the real-time feeds of what happens, and then people can subscribe to that or not. That will also generate a lot of information. Uh, and also here, the subject line should be uh, contain enough information, like in a commit, subject line should tell you what path was changed so that you know you can watch this. Maybe I'm interested in a certain uh, space in the code base, so I can subscribe, filter these messages, say whenever something happens in this area, I want to be informed. So basically, you generate a fire hose of events at a Twitter, and then people can uh, subscribe to what they want by filtering on subject lines, on senders, on, on whatever. And this is what provides this real-time project status information. This is uh, very uh, impressive in our Apache projects because if you're in a sufficiently busy project, there's always sometimes who, who, someone who's working, you know, based on the time zones. So you will commit code at 3 a.m. and at 3.5, someone says, oh, I reviewed your code already. This is very cool. It's only because we have these events in near real time that this is possible. And as I said, this makes the status meetings mostly uh, unneeded because the information is flowing. You know what's going on. You know what's the status. You can query the, the tracker. The broadcast help requests uh, already pretty much explained how that works. So the idea is that instead of asking Bob to fix the memory problem, you create an issue in the tracker. Even if you know that Bob is going to do it, maybe you assign it to Bob. And Bob sees that and say, ah, don't have time right now, have something more urgent. The issue is already in the tracker. He doesn't need to re-explain it to someone else. He can just point them. It's shareable. You know, uh, Isabel, can you work on CQ1234? She says, yes, no worries. So that's uh, using the tracker for everything. And it's not much work. You can describe an issue in two lines. Yes, Benson. Hey, Bertrand, uh, I'm, I'm as jet lagged as you are. I wanted to back you up one slide. Uh, so, on, on Activity Trail, yeah. we recently moved to Git from Subversion, and it has an interesting effect on this, yes, because people tend to drift off onto their own branches for sort of unpredictable periods of time, and yeah. while they're there, they're kind of in the, you know, under the cone of silence. Have you, do you have any sort of advice about sort of development rhythm in terms of? Tell everybody just keep pushing their private branches or just don't worry about it until they're ready to merge or what? Yeah. Uh, we used to say commit early, commit often. With Git, I would say merge early, merge often. You know, it's, uh, Git is, uh, I, I love doing branches in Git, but they have to be very small. You should do a branch for one issue. Issues should be small and atomic. If not, you should split them into smaller issues. And then if someone doesn't merge within 
one day something's usually wrong or, or it's a special case sometimes okay you need to do a big thing and you're going to merge and it's going to be a big mess you know git is much better than subversion in general for merging but still when you have a lot to merge you're bound to have conflicts so i think this often comes down to not breaking the the problem into smaller small units small enough units and in most cases you can you know break down break it down you have one issue that says fix the memory problems okay uh, what memory problems we have 50 of them okay create 50 issues and then you can do a branch and merge for every issue right. i think that's uh, but i am seeing this yeah i'm definitely seeing this with git uh, Especially, you know, we see also say that a system, if you have three groups creating a system, you will have three modules. And uh, I see that if we have three groups working on the Git code base, you s tend to have three cycles of merging. People will tend to go and, uh, and that, and you, I, I try to fight that. Say, so, you know, merge early, merge often, I think would be the, would be the answer for that. So for the, about the, the broadcast request and, and using and abusing the tracker, uh, another very nice thing with that is that Bob, who's, when he's working on that, can make it his own schedule. The way we, we, you know, I don't want a manager to tell me what I should work on today. Sometimes this happens because shipping is tomorrow. I need someone to work on this problem. So Bertrand, can you please do it? Ah, okay. He says, please, so I do it. But uh, in general, I want to come up in the morning and do a query in the tracker. What are the issues that are potentially assignable to me? And what do I feel like working on today? Because you're not, uh, you're not always in the same mood. Sometimes, you know, I'm tired. Uh, the kids have been uh, partying all night. And, uh, and I don't feel like working in complex stuff. So I'll try to do some simple stuff that is progress. Another day, I'm, I woke up early and I feel very well. So I'll tackle the heavy memory problems. If your coworkers can do their own schedule, uh, based on constraints, of course. Maybe I have 10 issues with the same priority, then I can choose whatever I want and work on, on one of them. So that's also, I think, great benefit of, of working like that. And obviously, the tracker contributes to the real-time status updates. Then, the, yeah, the status updates are then mostly tracker queries. And, and that's very, very useful. The uh, self-service archives. It's, uh, this is fairly easy because these tools uh, generate their own archives. A, a good tracker will be queryable. It will store everything that happened. Uh, code repository does the same thing. Email, you can create email archives fairly easily. So it's all automatic. What you need to do is to work with that in mind. So make sure when you, when you commit code to write a sensible comment so that it's useful you know, what to search on it and, and to, to, to look at it later. Same thing for, as I was saying, this, this quoting thing in email. If you take time, you're careful about how you quote, it will give more values to your archive. If you include links and URLs in your messages, it also brings more value to the whole thing. So the, the self-service thing is mostly automatic uh, because the tools do that. But if you have it in the back of your mind, it will help you create better archives over time. We recently, in our system, we closed an issue that had been open in 2001. This was, this was great, you know, and you had the whole history. Why didn't they fix it in 2002? We didn't have time. Okay, and then in 2004, someone said, can we fix this? Ah, uh, no, it's too complicated. Maybe it will, the standard will change, so maybe we don't need it. And we had the whole history. It, it was hilarious. But we fixed it, and we know, you know who worked on it uh, all the time. And this is, uh, this is very cool when you're working on long-lived systems. If you're doing a throwaway thing, you don't care. But uh, in our industry, our customers tend to use our systems for five or ten years. So it's invaluable to be able to go back. You know, why, why do we have this feature? Oh, yeah, I understand. I didn't understand, but now by looking at the tracker, uh, I find it. And it's also invaluable for new project members. You know, there's this theory that adding more people to a project doesn't improve productivity. If you do this right, it can actually improve productivity. If people can have all the basic information in self-service, it will, you know, help in breaking these communication uh, bottlenecks. So the benefits of this stuff. Uh, the shared vision will f help foster project success. Very often project failures happen because people, uh, they have different goals. 
they're working on the same project, but they're not, uh, they don't really agree on what they're doing. So if you can create this shared vision by documenting, by having the discussions in email, which is archived, it can be very helpful. It's, even with that, it's hard, but uh, it can help a lot. The real-time status updates uh, definitely help have less meetings. Meetings are incredibly expensive. Uh, I heard recently someone saying, from now on, I start e every meeting by telling people how much this meeting is costing per hour. You know, we, you have 10 people here. Oh, senior project manager, okay. Senior developer, yeah, okay. This meeting is, is costing us $2,000 an hour. You want to do it? You want to waste time on that? You want to, you know, extend it to one hour because it is scheduled for one hour? That's what Outlook told you. We sh would be finished about 40 minutes, but it just drags because it's scheduled for, no for an hour. It's not good, you know. So if you can reduce the number of meetings, the numbers of useless meetings, then it's a great benefit. And then it allows you to have enjoyable, useful, productive meetings, which are worth $2,000 an hour. The broadcast help request and the, the use and abuse of the tracker uh, help a lot in planning, obviously. By breaking down your stuff in smaller units, it's much easier to reallocate, uh, you know, transfer issues to different people, see, see the evolution, how many issues you're, 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 you're resolving and so on. So I think there's a, it takes time to, to, to do that right. And Apache projects, successful Apache projects are often very good examples of that, where you see that one issue is really about one thing and, and only one thing is precise. It's linked to other issues. You have umbrella issues that, that contain others uh, and so on. So this is extremely helpful for planning and for, for you know, knowing where you stand. Uh, that, that's a great help. And uh, Obviously, the searchable archives and all this creates a knowledge base about your, your project and your product. And uh, what we do in our group is that we say, for example, that an issue in the tracker should contain the use case and a, a small test procedure that allows you to, you know, a developer to look at it and understand how it works. And then our docs people take that. They, they often use that as a basic, as a starting point for the documentation. Uh, and so it's it's beneficial um, all the way. So these are the key, the main um, benefits, I would say, the project success, of course, having less meetings, more efficient planning, and creating a knowledge base as you go with little effort. You know, the tracker thing, once you get used to it, okay, I fixed the problem, I write two lines, maybe four lines in the tracker, close the issue, that's done. But there is some is history, there is some information. There's links to the code, so it creates a rich, web of uh, information. Some side uh, benefits of that, uh, you will end up with more sustainable software and, and processes. By having this backbone of collaboration in your group, uh, it's easier to you know, add, change people, expand the group, shrink it, whatever, because it, the, the core information is independent of the people, and you don't have this email inboxes, knowledge bases that go away with the people. You have it in a central, reusable place. Uh, for, the, for the workers, uh, the, the colleagues, uh, it will improve your communication skills. It's much harder to communicate on a mailing list than directly. Uh, and, it, you know, sometimes you need to think a bit more, but it's good. It helps you be clearer. And if you cannot express something in a few phrases on, in, a, in, a, in a tracker, it's probably not clear on your mind, so you need to go back and, and refine it. You will also learn to make mistakes in public, with the key to, to success in, the, in, this, uh, in these schemes. Uh, I've been active in Apache since 2000-something. Uh, you can find some interesting blunders of mine in these archives. I'm not dead. Uh, so, I mean, when you work in an open way, you will make mistakes in public. And getting used to it is a good thing because, uh, you know, it, it happens. Nobody's perfect. And uh, it will also help you expose where you can add value, which is very useful. You know, in a, in a soccer team, uh, if you're good to, to, to play on the right side and they put you on the left side, it will usually not work. So it's good to expose to others. Oh, this guy is good at solving hard memory problems. Then it, it, can, be help, it can help, you know, create the, 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 the group effect. 
being working in open way often also creates better software structures because you get the the the, uh, the feedback from the others and they see it and uh, and because it's open there's more chance that someone will 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 see it it's the you know many eyeballs of open source if you can translate that in your own company that will be helpful and as a result we'll get higher software quality uh, over time reputation and mutual trust that's also a big benefit for the for the, the colleagues you know knowing who who's good at what and and establish trust because you see people solving hard problems so it, it helps you know bond the the, the group uh, so in general you'll get better quality and, and more fun i tried to to summarize this uh, in five wisdoms so if you remember just one thing okay just five things from this talk, uh, it might be the most important thing. And this is pretty much, again, how we work in Apache. And all, all this is applicable inside a, a company, a lot, even a large one. The first thing is, if it didn't happen on the dev list, it didn't happen. So any decision, any technical decision must be uh, discussed, documented on the dev list. Sometimes in Apache projects, people ask, oh, but is it okay to have phone conferences? And we say, it, it's okay, but bring anything important back to the dev list. Don't make any decisions in this group. Decision should happen uh, in a place where everybody can, can have a look. Second wisdom is whatever you're working on, it must be backed by an issue in the tracker. It's a very good rule to make sure the tracker uh, writes a story of the project and you can go back to this information. Third wisdom is, if it's not in the source code control system, it doesn't exist. I don't care if you have source code on a file share somewhere. Hopefully, this is going away today. Everybody's aware of source code control systems. <laughs> but it, it's been a struggle. And people um, said, yeah, but have a binary. OK, if you have a gigantic binary file, maybe you need to have it in a different place with a permanent URL. But it's, it's, a, it's a special case. Whatever is important needs a permanent URL. You know, wiki pages, email archives, code comments, whatever. We, so as I said, we transitioned from Bugzilla to Jira in our group at Adobe last uh, two years ago, maybe. And we created a redirection system so that the old Bugzilla URLs are still valid because we have that in our, in our issues, in, 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 in wiki pages, whatever. So we wanted these to, to stay, stay valid. So we created a mapping, which is a very stupid uh, nginx, uh, configuration file with 60,000 entries doesn't don't we don't care you know it doesn't have to be very efficient but it's it's working so we kept the the old urls of the issues are still valid and will redirect you to the new uh, issues in the new system and uh, then you should be able to have to answer this question what happened when you were away you know, this week I'm at a conference, I'm, I'm not paying attention to what's happening in my group, not close attention. When I go back, I can check the activity stream. I can go to this, uh, in our case it's a mailing list, and I can skim the messages and see pretty much what happened while I was away. So these five uh, wisdoms will help you, uh, you know, measure your process. Is it, is it working, is it working this open development way? And once again, very close to what we're doing in, in Apache. So that, that's us, that's, our, that's our, the philosophy of my group. Um, we work like an open source project as much as we can. Everybody has a voice, you know, the, the meritocracy aspect. You can also have that in a company. Of course, in a company, you, you will have bosses, which we don't have in Apache. Uh, we don't have technical bosses in our projects. In a company project, you will have a boss, but uh, they should understand that the, you know, as much as possible, you use the meritocracy, and then at some point, business needs might get in the way. Say, so, okay, tomorrow is a release, do whatever, and then we do it. Then you switch modes for uh, as a small time as possible, then you go back to the more open way. Information is shared all the time, this is very important. Uh, and people learn from each other just by seeing what's going on, uh, and seeing who's good at what, and seeing the work they do. And the meetings are for vision and software design, the basic info flows all the time. This is very important, you know. Having this flow of all the boring basic information should be flowing, you shouldn't, ask to, you shouldn't have to ask for it. Uh, so as a conclusion, this works for the Apache Software Foundation, obviously. This works for the, the, uh, this Adobe CQ5 team where I'm, where I'm involved. Uh, if you want to do that, I would suggest that you start with small steps. 
you know, try to break this apart, see where, where do we start, what's missing in, in our project. Uh, small, yeah, small steps that you can control. If you try to introduce that as one big thing, it will usually fail because people need to adjust and uh, we, sometimes we don't, we don't like too big changes uh, at a time. Also, I have a reading list uh, at this at this URL on my in my delicious bookmarks that I'm that I'm uh, you know expanding all the time on different articles on on that. Uh, there's not many people from Switzerland here, but we do remote work if you're really good. So we are hiring in in Basel if you're interested. So I hope that. Uh, the jet lag is not going in the way too much, and I've been clear in my explanations. So basically, the basic idea is to, yeah, take the good things of the Apache way, apply this in your business. There are some constraints, but you can very, uh, I mean, largely apply this, and it, it works very well for us. So I hope you can try that if you're not practicing that already. And I'm open for, for questions now, if you have any. Yes? What level? Yeah. Um, would you scope this at that team level, or is this something you're advocating even across these teams? Um, we pretty much on our way to, I would say, to reproduce the Apache Federation model inside our, our the, the part of Adobe that's working like that. So we have uh, we have different projects. We have uh, which have each have their own mailing list. Uh, we're starting to do also home pages like the Apache project home pages, the Git repositories and organizations. So I think what, what works best is the federation, federation model. Um, a tendency, I don't know, in, in my company, I think someone looked at one point at the, as, at the number of mailing lists and it's incredible. We have pre, I would say we might have as, as much mailing lists as employees. You know, but some of them are historic and not used anymore. Uh, we have been also pushing for busy mailing lists. There's a Stefano Mazzocchi, an Apache member. Uh, he he wrote this this thing about bi the busy mailing list pattern, and you want that. People are often reluctant. I don't want to get 200 messages a day, but we want to put the, get the people together. So we we might have one mailing list per project, but maybe we also have one. Uh, you know, cross-cutting mailing list. And that's something that, that's, in my opinion, that's a bit missing in Apache. We don't have cross-cutting technical mailing lists. Like, you know, if I have a, something that's, uh, that's relevant to anybody working with Java in Apache, I don't have a place to send that. And we have that problem. That we, for example, we have several OSGI projects uh, and we don't have an OSGI at Apache mailing list. And we also don't want too, too much mailing list, so I don't have a, a solution for that. Maybe we, maybe we need just a tech at Apache.org list, and then we could tag the subjects uh, with uh, with whatever is relevant. That that might be interesting. But that's the difficulty so, in, a, in the large organizations. I mean, I've seen groups literally integrate the same API just because you know they're different groups. It's a back yeah. group and maybe a web focused group, but there's same similar integration points. Yeah. Yeah, well, I would say what's missing, what's often missing in a company setting is, you know, on the web you have Google and you have blogs uh, with RSS feeds, and it's easier to find something that's wherever on the web. In a company, it, it's harder to have that because you have different systems and you don't have it. Often, you don't have an indexing thing that's as as good as Google, so that that's a challenge. So I would say, yeah, the federation model is probably what works best. We have an, another question here. Yeah? Um, so it's, it works great with that whole mailing list thing. Uh, you believe in uh, the technical team members involved. Yeah. How, how do you, uh, what about the role of the business owner slash the person who requests the feature? And you might you need to discuss like the intricacies of the feature or the use cases they didn't think about or like you point out some flaws in their requirements. Yeah. Uh, so we're trying to get all the, the business folks to, to work in this way. 
So like if they want a new feature, they should write a use case somewhere on a wiki or, or you know, uh, scribble it, it somewhere. And then uh, quite often tech people need to, to act as a proxy because you know, they might not be using the, the tools as much as we do, so they might not be used used to use them in, in a very efficient way. So that's, I would say that's what works often well, to have one technical person be the proxy so that this information can flow into the system uh, without people maybe having to, to do that directly. But we, we got good buy-in for the, like our project managers, our engineering managers to, to, to work in this system. It's, okay, it's, Yep. Or there's a Slack email started with, you know, two or three people CC. Right. But I guess, then, like you said, that's not in a particular mailing list. Right. Then we, I would treat that as we do, for example, as I said, in, in Apache, if people have, have an IRC chat meeting, we tell them, please bring the, the important information to the dev list. And then we do the same. So maybe we'll get one email from, from the, you know, the business person saying we need to do this, 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 this. And someone from us will translate that into issues and, and wiki pages. So yeah, act, act as a proxy so that the information flows into the, the system. Yes, Brian. I know you say you don't really use email a lot, um, but um, the, uh, obviously the Patrick Software Foundation email is still like the lifeblood of notifications for bugs, and, you know, commit yep. messages, that sort of thing. Um, yep. And aside from, you know, looking at, at some tool-specific activity streams, is there any better still, like, one funnel to integrate these different events into that, that you found, or, or uh, should, should it have to use something other than mailing lists? Let me right. Bring it that way. Right. So uh, what I've seen, what I've seen work well in projects is to have a mailing list called simply activity at you know, activity at HTTPD, uh, whatever, uh, where you know it's all technical activity messages. And then it's like, it's more like a message bus than, than an email list. Uh, we, have, we haven't used any better tools so far. RSS should, should help for that, well, but the it's... The thing that's really nice about email is I can delete the stuff very quickly, scan through it that I know I don't need to deal with. Right. And the one or two that I know I would do want to go back to and spend more time on stay in my... You can keep it, deal, yeah. You know, it's part of my ordinary workflow. Right, okay, right. Rather than being a separate tool or like a favorite uh, tweet, tweet or something like yeah. that, you know, that I'd have to go around the side to... Yeah, it's a good, it's good work for it. Yeah, I think what's important is that the, the technical messages should not go to the, to the discussion list. They should go to a list that's definitely technical because you usually don't want them in the archives. You know, if you search, you, I want, if I'm searching the email archive, I want to search either on the in the human discussions or in the event stream. So it's good to separate this at this at this point. But no, I haven't seen any better tool than an email list so far. <laughs> it's funny, but uh, still, what works? Yes. And you just indicated that basically you have distribution lists that are, you know, like sometimes mailing lists turn into chats. Yeah. You have like somebody just asking things. Yeah. Like you said, you don't want it in the archive. So basically, when when the discussion from the mailing list actually produces something technical, is that when you commit it to the archive? Uh, no, we. So the question is, yeah, do, do we do we uh, commit everything to the archive or not? In our case, we we have everything in the archive, so there's a lot of noise. And that's, that's a characteristic of, of mailing list. That's why I'm saying that, that the gist of the discussion should go somewhere else. And, and usually that the result is creating an issue. So you discuss, you know, how are we going to do this thing? And the discussion might be very messy and very noisy. But then at the end, we reach a conclusion. I would transpose this conclusion into a, a JRA issue or a tracker issue. Okay. And that, that's where you get the more uh, valid, you know, you know that, that there's always a lot of noise in the, in the email. And I don't think that's avoidable. It's, it's more, for us, it's, the email is more like uh, informal discussion media. Yeah. Okay, in Apache, you have the votes. So we also do that in our groups. We do, we do the Apache-like votes for, for stuff, which are identified by a vote header in the subject line. So you can use that to filter them. So you know that these are more valid, more structured than the, the fluffy uh, discussions that happen all the time. But that, that's what makes also the email search very inefficient because there's always tons of noise in this, in this stuff. It would be good, yeah, if we could tag, like, like Brian saying, you know, he's deleting the messages and keeping the ones that are important. If we could tag email messages after the fact, 
that could be very useful. You know, go to your archive and say, oh, add a important, valid uh, noise tag to a message. That, that could be could be a good improvement to the archives. Yes? So, uh, I'm an Apache computer, so I'm very familiar with what you described yeah. through that process. Um, one of the things that uh, I wanted to ask you, so the, the importance of small issues is definitely something that, that I've learned over time. Um, but just for the benefit of the group, um, breaking down larger architectural type changes where they don't necessarily they'll come to you in that style. Yep. Um, how, how have you worked through that process of breaking those down into small issues? So yeah, if you if you're making a big change into the into the system, how how can you uh, break that into small issues? Um, that that's that's a hard subject, and that that that's the same thing as Benson was saying about the merges. You know, how do you avoid big merges? I think it's really important to try to maybe you have a first issue, a first merge. That's a big thing because that's when you're doing the big change, and try to try to minimize that. You know, defer as much as you can to to after that. So when, once you do the big bang change, then you can go back to that. But you, you yeah, there's some points where you can't, where you really have a, a massive change, to, or or you decide that you're creating a new product. That could be sometimes that can be can be a can be a way out to say, okay, this is so big a change that we consider this as a new product v2 of the thing, and then then you start a new and. The, Usually, when you start a new product, it's it's much more efficient if you can work like three, four people co-located, and then maybe you forget about our, all this temporarily. Say, okay, we're creating a new thing, so nobody will know anything until we have the first the first uh, version. But I don't have a I don't have a good answer for that. All other than try to try to make that as small the change as small as possible, and then go back to normal normal pace. But uh, yeah, it's pretty much like creating a new thing where you need to work in a slightly more you know intimate way and then then you can you can go back to the more group way yeah 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 so so I think before doing it you, you should create clearly define what you're going to do and have use cases or description and uh, writing this down in wiki is a very good exercise. You know, it relates to what Noreen was saying about documentation. Once you, your ideas are clear enough that you can express it in a document that's readable, it means, okay, you have made a good process. If you, if you skip this step, you might end up with something that's vaguely defined and, and vaguely implemented then in the end. Okay, one more question. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, if if I'm if I'm if the the thing is if it's a small use case that you can express in five lines, I will put the use case directly in the issue, and then put also the 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 test uh, description also in the issue. Then the issue is standalone. If it's more complicated than that, uh, then I might create a wiki page for the use case and link to that in the issue. Say, implement this use case. Uh, so is it that the wiki, wiki page can, might end up being translated into multiple issues? Is that, is that a good thing? Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That, yeah. That's, that's, that could, could be the case, yeah. yeah. So th that the wiki page describes a more, a larger use case that yeah, you need several issues to implement. Yeah, I agree with that. Okay, so I'll be around if you have more questions, and thank you for the attention.